Hi there, I'm Sarah Allen. I'm Assistant Curator of International Art at Tate Modern and I'm here to walk you through my choices from reviewing the Archive of Source magazine. So the first magazine I want to flag um, features the work of Morris Hobson and it was John Duncan actually, the editor of Source, who flagged the, uh, the work of Morris Hobson to me. I was installing an exhibition at Belfast Exposed Gallery uh, and it was there that John highlighted this very important artist. So what really struck me about this um, body of work is the story behind it because Hobson grew up in Northern Ireland, um, in rural Northern Ireland during the Troubles, born into a farming family but never really feeling that that context fit who he was. So feeling he was always out of place and I feel like that's a story that probably a lot of people in Ireland might relate to. And then he goes on to be involved in this very tragic event, essentially caught up in an IRA bomb blast, and that event would lead, leave, leave him disfigured um, and suffering post-traumatic epilepsy. So it is this event um, and the aftermath that he explores through portraiture. Um, and the images he makes are kind of absolutely moving and so, so striking. Um, you can see here he's using double exposure uh, but also wrapping twine around the face to create these kind of fleshy distortions um, and they're really violent at times you can see here the actual twine going over the eye the open eye um, and Declan Long writes beautifully about Hobson he draws a parallel to Francis Bacon uh, which I thought was you know fascinating because Bacon really, you know, his, his, his working method inflicted this injury on the face and on the body, you know, and I had the joy of working with the Bacon Archive when I was um, uh, within the curatorial department at the Hugh Lane, and so I was able to see how Bacon used photography, kind of cutting, tearing, restitching all of these images from these various different sources to create his uh, eventual portraits, and I thought, it, yeah, it, it really spoke to many of these portraits by Hobson. And then in flicking through another uh, magazine, I just happened to come across uh, this review of Francesca Woodman's um, exhibition at the Douglas Hyde Gallery. Um, and it's illustrated by an image here where you can see where she's wrapped the legs with sellotape, uh, but in a very similar kind of way to Hobson and um, kind of creating this fleshy, meaty uh, idea through um, through the use of props. And I just found it really poignant to kind of think about the fact that these were two artists working at the same time in history, um, both using photography to exercise demons um, and then both taken in really, really tragic circumstance far too early. Um, and then Woodman, I guess, goes on to be internationally renowned um, and a household name. Um, Hobson, not so much, but um, in my opinion, uh, no less important, no less moving. So the next choice on my list is a portfolio of work by Vic Victor Sloan. Um, and Sloan's images and his practice on a whole, I feel, are just so singular in, in their contribution to Northern Irish photography. I mean, I guess the image of Northern Ireland has crystallised in a lot of people's minds as one of street violence. Um, and that's really because for so long the image was black and white documentary images of violence, often shot by um, photographers kind of who were parachuted in to document the troubles. And what is amazing about Sloane's work is it's absolutely not anything like that. Um, his practice is very much based on, you know, kind of scoring, painting over, um, interfering with negatives to create these kind of multi-layered images that uh, really cut against the idea of the photograph as a window onto another world. Um, and what I really love is they also, because of that gestural hand, um, that gestural expression reinsert the idea of the individual, the idea of um, kind of not being subsumed into a dominant narrative, um, which I feel is really important uh, in thinking about photography in Northern Ireland in general. 
So next up is an interview with Tina Kampf um, and it's conducted by writer Caroline Malloy. It's called Can Photographs Tell the Story of Black History and the Black Present? Um, I'm a big fan of Kampf's writing and the interview is really kind of an overview of her key texts. One being The Other Germans, Black Germans and the Politics of Race. And in that book she interviews two black Germans who lived under the Nazi regime um, and kind of um, through the interview it becomes apparent that despite you know a nation and an environment that would refuse their identity and refuse them they were still very keen to stake a claim to their germanness um, and this is something that again is apparent when she goes to um, engage with the dyke collection which is in birmingham city library um, and is a collection of studio portraits of afro-caribbeans who migrated to britain in the period after the wind rush and in these images, the people are really presenting a very positive uh, image of themselves. Um, and they were often, these photographs sent back to family members as proof of a kind of life well lived and a success story. And Camp makes the point, of course, this was happening at a moment when this community was being treated horrifically in Britain. But despite all that, um, wanted to um, stake a claim to their Britishness. So it's, it's a fascinating interview. And in it, she also makes this argument for listening to images, for moving beyond seeing a photograph to feeling a photograph, um, which is a fascinating kind of idea. And I really like the idea that, you know, one can think um, about photography and its engagements with all the senses. And it has some fantastic overlaps with this article, Embodied Meanings, the Sound and Feel of Photographs by Elizabeth Edwards. Um, yeah, so I highly recommend reading more about camp um, and yeah. Well, the next article is by Fiona Carney. It's called Alternatives to Propaganda, Strategies of Representation in Fine Art Photography and Media in Northern Ireland. And it's a really great overview of um, this particularly fertile moment in Northern Irish photography, which is really borne out of a reaction uh, to the predominant media image of Northern Ireland that was perpetuated. So one of violence, street violence, um, one that was very reductive. Um, so in response to that, a lot of Northern Irish photographers uh, took the person out of the frame and looked to the landscape as a means to kind of, you know, gain some space from the conflict, um, but also to present a more nuanced reading of the conflict. Um, often, you know, uh, images that conflict was found in kind of embedded little traces rather than something really really obvious. Uh, another mode was to create images that you know frustrated easy reading so they were ambiguous you know they kind of cut against binaries of Catholic Protestant loyalist Republican and um, so Carney goes through uh, some really fascinating photographers Paul Seawright, Paul Quinn, Patrick McCoy, John Duncan um, and I feel like this article is like a bit of a primer to a book Colin Graham went on to write um, on Northern Irish photography so I definitely recommend um, checking that out um, uh, because as I say yeah this was a really really crucial moment in the history of photography in Northern Ireland um, and really inspiring. So next is a portfolio of work by British photographer Louis Quayle. A um, really compelling series about Louis's brother Justin, who is a bird watcher, um, also suffers from schizophrenia. Um, and the series is just, you know, not only really strong um, portraiture in its own right, but what captivates me about it is, you know, the sense of intimacy, the sense of um, collaboration between the two brothers in making this series. Um, and the pure kind of tenderness at, at the heart um, of the project. And I guess in one sense you could compare it to photographers like Richard Billingham's Raise a Laugh because he equally was taking this very intimate view of his own family life. Um, but whereas Billingham might be a little bit, might feel a little bit more sensationalist, even though I hesitate to say that because it's hard to kind of sensationalize one's own life and one's own experience as an insider, um, none of that is, none of that feeling is apparent to me anyway in Louis's uh, body of work. It's just really honest and raw and beautiful and um, 
joyful as well. So yeah, absolutely highly recommend checking out this series. Next up is a portfolio of um, images by the artist Tish Morrissey called 10 People in a Suitcase. Um, and in it, she, she made the work on residency in Finland um, and she engaged with an archive there of images of the locals. Um, so she's restaging those images that she found uh, kind of cr crossing gender, age, uh, class. Um, and these kind of really, you know, performative, um, humorous at times, uh, sardonic, uh, situations. So um, I really wanted to choose Tish because I feel like she hasn't received the recognition possibly that she, she deserves and she's really someone who's been working um, at the forefront of performative self-portraiture for a very long time um, and yeah I absolutely loved to uh, be reminded of this series. The article I'm going to talk about next is um, an interview with photographer Sunil Gupta. It's conducted by Anthony Levera, who's also a photographer. And it's a really great oversight of um, Sunil's practice, which for decades has been investigating LGBTQIA communities from his very early work in Christopher Street, New York, to his work in the 80s in Delhi, where he, um, had, he collaborated with couples um, to stage portraits in, in really fascinating ways that ensured their privacy um, because obviously you know to photograph queer couples at that time in Delhi was there was a huge associated risk so it's very interesting um, to hear him explain how he navigated those kind of relationships and then also uh, he talks about really important exhibitions and um, for example ecstatic antibodies which was co-curated with um, fascinating photographer Tessa Boffin um, and these kind of shows are really really important in bringing queer photographers to the fore at a certain moment in in, um, in British photography history um, into a cultural landscape that was largely hostile to such narratives um, and the fact she's interviewed by Anthony is really great because Anthony's practice too really deals with this Id these ideas of um, hierarchies in photography and the politics of representation um, and I feel like that makes for a really uh, interesting dialogue and then Anthony's work itself is discussed in another issue of Source and um, his assisted self-portraits so yeah highly recommend reading a little bit more about both those photographers. The next choice I've made is from a very early issue of Source um, and it looks at uh, a fascinating image which advertised the Good Friday referendum in 98. Uh, there probably isn't a person in Northern Ireland who lived through that time that wouldn't remember this image. You see the family on the beach uh, looking out on a sunset with the words underneath, it's your decision. Um, so Richard West, uh, editor at Source, uh, realised that something not quite right in the image in that the sun sets in the west and there's no west coast in Northern Ireland. So goes on this kind of investigative journey to find out uh, the origins of the photo. Um, and he succeeds um, and finds a photographer um, and finds out the image is actually shot in Cape Town. So nothing to do with Northern Ireland at all. And then there's this fascinating kind of visual critique of the image that follows Richard's piece in this issue that uh, describes how, you know, actually the family look like they're standing on uncertain ground, starved of air because of the cropping and looking at quite an apocalyptic sunset. So it's not really doing what it needs to do in terms of advertising the brave new world, the world of peace that's going to, um, that we're all going to enjoy in the future. So I just think it's really important that Source interrogated this image, which is so key um, in, you know, picturing peace in Northern Ireland. My next choice is a critique of an advertising image by the jewellery company Adler. It's written by Judith Williamson. There's really um, so many reasons I've chosen this just because there's so much to critique within the image. It's um, so problematic in terms of its reproduction of racist tropes, um, exoticizing, fetishizing ideas of the African other. On uh, the woman's back, she's carrying a diamond and emerald encrusted 
bracelet. Uh, it's supposed to be a member, um, the woman is supposed to be a member of the Maasai Mara tribe um, and the idea that the jewellery company were getting at was trying to associate their product with the strength and resilience of the Maasai Mara. Um, I don't think they've been very successful but uh, Judith Williamson does a fantastic job of just commenting on how bad it is making the point um, that the bracelet, the bright symbol of Western wealth literally hangs on the back of the black woman as if she must shoulder the weight of it, borne on a rope that looks crude and painful. So yeah, a fantastic critique of this incredibly problematic image. My next article to discuss is by David Campany. It's called Strangely Simple or Simply Strange Photo Books for Children. Um, and it's a little walk through the genre of uh, children's picture books. Um, and I really enjoyed reading this. Um, and there were some fascinating uh, discoveries, such as the fact that Edward Steichen made picture books together with Mary Cauldron. Um, and Campany also goes on to talk about other photographers we wouldn't necessarily associate with this genre. Um, and I really liked just learning a little bit more about the psychology behind children's picture books. Um, at Tate I work with the Martin Parr photo book collection so I am a sucker for a really uh, good uncovering of a hidden photo book history. So yeah, highly recommend this one.